You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Well, last uh, Sunday and today is a little bit different than what we normally do. We've been going through the book of Acts, and then in the course of going through the book of Acts and looking at all of the miracles individually as we've been going through it, decided after we saw the very last miracles recorded in the book of Acts that we'd step back and answer the question, what are the purpose of miracles? What are miracles for? What purpose did they serve? And are miracles for today? So last week we started that. We spent a whole hour looking at from the book of Acts and other portions of the New Testament, what miracles were for. And today is sort of part two of that. Last week at the beginning of the message, I read to you a list of questions. And those are duplicated basically on your bulletin insert in the same form that I read them to you last week. We sort of constructed a biblical way of viewing miracles and understanding miracles and the difference between miracles and providence. And I told you that today we would take part two of this. This really should have been tacked on to the end of last week's message, but I didn't want to preach for two hours and you didn't want to sit here for two hours, so instead we're going to take it into one-hour sessions. And so we've got a, some of you are nodding. Boy, we're ever thankful for that. Today we're going to take the second half of this and we're not, we're not looking at any one particular text. This is more really of an exposition of a, a multitude of texts all sort of wrapped up into this one subject of getting our hands around miracles. Now it's important that you and I understand what miracles are and what the purpose of miracles are, and that we think rightly, because as a man thinks in his heart, what? So is he. That applies not just to what you are as an individual, but that applies theologically. How how you think about certain things determines how you read Scripture, how you worship, how you pray, how you approach God, how you view God. All of that is wrapped up in your thoughts and your intentions and, and your theology. So we want to make sure that we're thinking rightly about these things, because even particularly in the, with the subject of miracles, you can have tragic consequences if you think wrongly about the subject of miracles. I came across this story in the book uh, God's Healing Promise by Richard Mayhew. And he recounts a story that appeared in Newsweek magazine, September 10, 1973, an article titled The Exorcist. And here's what Mayhew writes. Larry and Alice Parker wanted God's best for their family of six, but the oldest son suffered from diabetes and regularly received insulin injections. When Daniel Badilla held special services in their Barstow, California church, the Parkers walked the aisle with 11-year-old Wesley. They sincerely sought a hearing mir- healing miracle. The preacher pronounced Wesley healed. Larry joyfully entered the words, quote, Praise God, our son is healed, end quote, into Wesley's insulin log but Wesley's next insulin test indicated differently. Yet by faith, the Parkers claimed the healing and blamed the unexpected insulin results on, you can guess, right? Satan. Shortly afterward, Wesley began to suffer the nausea and severe stomach cramps that predictably indicate low insulin. Larry and Alice postponed medical treatment and sought God's continued healing power through prayer. In spite of their sincere faith, Wesley fell into a coma and died three days later. Now, if you follow news stories and you follow movements and things that go on within the Christian church, you know that that's not an isolated incident. I can stand up and give you illustration after illustration, story after story of that same tragic type of thing happening. Not just people who die as a result of bad theology about miracles, but people who are severely disoriented and disappointed in God and get depressed and and wander around in a theological fog because of wrong thinking on the subject of miracles. That type of stuff goes on all over the place. Friends, you can turn on your television and you can see the extremes of Christianity. You can see somebody in a, a Armani suit with a Rolex watch and a bunch of hair gel throw, bouncing around on the stage, throwing the Holy Spirit on the audience, performing uh, leg lengthenings and, and healings and, and all of that bizarre stuff. And, and then you get the other sort of, the milder form of that in the seemingly innocent Pat Robertson, who thinks that God speaks to him personally and heals people through the television camera out there in TV land of back aches and stomach cramps and cancer and diseases and all of that stuff. It, it, it runs the gauntlet. And that type of stuff is not even extreme in Christianity anymore, friends. That type of stuff now is center stage. That has almost become the norm. 
as sick and as as serious as it is, it's almost the norm. Uh, sometimes it even crosses our paths. I read just recently in a local in our local newspaper an obituary a couple years ago. I've been preparing to preach this message for three years actually since we started the Book of Acts, and I've been sort of collecting stuff as I come across it. I came across an obituary that I read online in our local newspaper. And I'm not going to give you the name, but it said that this individual, quote, peacefully crossed over on this date of undetermined natural causes during meditation, end quote. Now, the obituary went on to read this. In loving memory and celebration of his unique life as healer, musician, lover, and friend, a memorial gathering will be held at blah, 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 end quote. Actually, the blah, blah, blah is not part of the quote. It was the the end quote belongs before the blah, blah, blah. In, in appreciation of his, or in celebration of his unique life as a healer. I have no reason to think that this individual was a believer or even claimed to be a believer in Christ because the memorial service was held at the local Gardenia Center, which is not where believers typically have their memorial services. But there are people within Christian church, outside the Christian church, in the New Age movement, in the Mormon church, in Islam, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in witchcraft, in Wiccaism, all who believe that they have a gift of miracles, a gift of healing, and the ability to heal. This person was a a healer. Now, my question is, if you were a healer, could you not have healed yourself of whatever it was that threatened to take your life during meditation at a young age of 32 years old? This guy died at 32 years old. But he thought he was a healer. I guarantee you he wasn't a healer. Uh, About a year ago, we had a guy show up for a worship service here, and, and I was teaching on... Uh, something very similar to what we're covering now. It was tongues or miracles or gifts of healing or sign gifts or something like that. And he just happened to be here for that one Sunday. And he came up afterwards, and this is one of the joys of pastoral ministry, came up afterwards and took issue with about a half a dozen things that I said. And we went round and round and round about all these things. And finally, and finally, the last subject that we covered was he said that while he was a missionary, and it was down in, I don't know, El Salvador, North America, South America, somewhere like that. I never was good at geology. And uh, so he... <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know it's geometry, not geology. (laughs) He said that as a missionary down there, he had actually saw a woman raised from the dead. And I said, really? Yep. I said, you were there? Yep. You saw it with your own eyes? That's right. I said, let me get this straight. She was clinically dead. Her heart had stopped beating. Her brain had stopped waving. Her blood had stopped pumping. She had stopped breathing. She was clinically dead for a period of time. And you prayed over her as a group, and she came back to life. And he said, that's right. Now, friends, I ask you, what are you going to make of a claim like that? What do you do with something like that? You want to know what I said? I'll tell you what I said in just a second. But before I do, I want you to notice how that conversation went from the subject of the text of Scripture to an experience. Do you notice that? And now we're dealing with an experience. And here's always the question, what do you make of what happened to me? That's always the question. It's it's never what does Scripture say and how do we interpret it and and how do I force my experience into the mold of Scripture. It's always, I had this experience, now you explain my experience to me. And I simply told him, I feel no compulsion whatsoever to explain your experience. I have no compulsion whatsoever to believe your experience. In fact, I am inclined to doubt your experience. Namely because we have a very powerful enemy who has the ability to deceive Christians and people and to do fake and lying signs and wonders. So I said, but I do know that the text of Scripture says such and such, and that's where we went back to. Well, there are a bunch of questions that you probably have on the subject of miracles that are in your bulletin. Last week we saw, and I just want to give you four statements to sort of sum up where we where we ended up last week. First of all, we recognize that there's a difference between providence and miracles. You understand what the difference between providence and miracles is? A miracle is something that is supernatural that God does through a human agent which cannot be explained in natural means. Providence is God supernaturally working and sovereignly working through natural things, all things together as He orchestrates and rules as sovereignly His creation. He does things providentially and He does things miraculously. And we saw the difference between those two things. And I spent some time on that because... A lot of our questions just evaporate once we sort of meditate on the difference between a miracle and providence. And once we are able to distinguish between the two, most of our questions are answered. So we saw there's a difference between miracles and providence. 
Second, we saw that most, the vast majority, but not all, most, the vast majority of miracles in the Bible occurred during three very brief periods of time. During the life of Moses and Joshua, during the lives of Elijah and Elisha, and during the lives of Jesus and the apostles. Furthermore, we saw that each of those explosions of miracles inaugurated a new era of revelation. With Moses and Joshua, it was the Old Testament Pentateuch and the historical books. With Elijah and Elisha, it was the prophetic age. With Jesus and the apostles, it was the New Testament. Then we went on to see that signs, wonders, and miracles are the authenticating marks of an apostle. Paul says the marks of an apostle were performed among you. How do you know that Paul was an apostle? Because he was able to perform signs wonders, and miracles. So they authenticated the messengers and the message and their ministry as God's stamp of authenticity. He speaks for me because he is able to do things that only God can do. Like Nicodemus said to Jesus, we know that you come from God because no man can do the things that you do unless God were with him. And then the fourth thing that we saw was that the... Sorry, that was the fourth... The fourth thing we saw, miracles happened through the hands of the apostles. Not all... But the vast majority of miracles in the New Testament ha- happened through the hands of the apostles. So that sort of constructs for us a biblical framework. Now let's look at the questions. The first question that you see labeled, listed in your insert, why don't we see parting of the Red Sea type miracles today like we did see in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Why don't we see these phenomenal things, people walking on water, multiplying bread and fish, parting of the Red Sea, parting of the Jordan River? Why don't we see that today like we did in the Old Testament and the New Testament? <laughs> Now, friends, I I confess something to you. Every time I'm coming home from south of town, I hit the south end of the Long Bridge, I secretly in my mind wish that I could part Lake Ponderay and just skip all of the headache of downtown and drive across on dry land to some shore near my house and drive up on there right up into my driveway. I wish I could do that, but I can't do that. But even today, people who are professed miracle workers would be hard-pressed to do something like that, wouldn't they? Part Lake Ponderay, part the Red Sea, part an ocean. Do something on that type of scale. Why don't we see that happening today? Well, reflect with me for a second on what the purpose of miracles was. What was the purpose of miracles? It was to authenticate a messenger. And even the parting of the Red Sea, just to use that as an example, authenticated Moses as the messenger of God, as the one who was giving the law and delivering God's people. Moses stood apart from the rest because he was able to do these things. So why don't we see them today? Well, because there's no purpose for them today. We don't need that type of authentication today. So the purpose having been fulfilled, we don't need to see it anymore. Now, if your view of miracles is that a miracle is simply God showing off, right? To ooh us and awe us like a big sort of fireworks demonstration. We just want God to show off His power. Perform a trick. Do a sign. This is what they said to Jesus. Perform a trick. Do a sign. Show us. Give us some, give, give us some stage show stuff. Get the bright lights out and the television cameras and ooh us and awe us and wow us, Jesus. That's what they wanted from Him. Now, if that's your definition of a miracle, it's just simply God demonstrating His power, then you and I might rightly ask, why don't we see that today? But once we understand the purpose of miracles was to authenticate a particular messenger, then we understand, ah, oh, that's why we don't see that today. There's no need. The purpose has been fulfilled. Second question. Did miracles end with Jesus and the apostles? And if miracles are to authenticate the ministry of the apostles as they took the gospel to new areas for the first time, would it not be biblical to expect or accept that God may do the same thing as the gospel goes to new places today? So did miracles end with Jesus and the apostles? Now, you're not sure whether to nod or shake your head, right? Did miracles end with Jesus and the apostles, yes or no? No, miracles did not. Miracle workers. Did miracle workers end with Jesus and the apostles? We don't have that anymore, do we? But not miracles. So that's a yes and no question. Yes, in a sense, miracle workers, God authenticating specific individuals, that did end with Jesus and the apostles, but the ability and the, and the fact that God does miracles today did not end with Jesus and the apostles because God is still God and God can do anything that He wants to do. So you and I can't put Him in a box and say, you can't do this anymore. He can do anything He wants to do, anytime He wants to do, any way He wants to do it, for any reason that He chooses. He is the only truly free being in all of the universe. And He can do anything He wants. Now the second part of the question gives me a chance to sort of clarify something. And Look at the second part of the question. If miracles are to authenticate the ministry of the apostles as they took the gospel 
to new areas for the first time, would it not be biblical to accept that God may do the same thing as the gospel goes to new places today? Because there are people who say, in the New Testament, the miracles accompanied the gospel as it went into territory where the gospel had never been before. So unreached territory where there had been no gospel proclamation, whenever the apostles went into those areas, there was explosion of miracles to authenticate the ministry as it went into those unreached formerly unreached areas. So if the gospel's doing, if we're doing that today, going into tribes and jungles where the gospel has never been, would we not expect to see miracles happen today to authenticate that message? That's a good question. But, but here's the, here's the confusion. The purpose of miracles was not to authenticate the message as it went to new areas. The purpose of miracles was to authenticate the message or the messenger, period. Period had nothing to do with where the apostles were at. Do you remember how many miracles were done in Jerusalem before they even left the walls of the city? Remember that? An explosion of miracles. Why? It had nothing to do with going into unreached areas. It had everything to do with authenticating the messenger. So there were miracles that were done at Iconium and Lystra and Antioch and these different places that Paul traveled. Yeah, those were new areas, but there were also miracles that were done in the city of Jerusalem before they ever went into quote-unquote unreached territory or pagan areas. Because the purpose of miracles is to authenticate the messenger. It has nothing to do with where it's at. Now, the question that's kind of floating around in your mind, and I want to answer it, is this. Then today, do, do we not need this authenticated? Right? Say, I become a missionary, I take the word of God to an unreached tribe or an unreached people group, and I begin to preach and proclaim and translate the scriptures into their language and teach them the word of God. Would I not expect that God would lend his authentication to this word, to my ministry, to my message, as I bring the message of truth. In other words, I might ask you, show, show to me some sign that demonstrates to me that the book you hold in your hand is the Word of God. Give me a sign. Give me a trick. Give me some authentication, some certification that shows that this is the Word of God. If that's the Word of God, you're holding it in your hands, authenticate it. Show me a sign. How do you respond to that? The same way the author of Hebrews did in Hebrews chapter 2. We looked at the passage last week. We can't neglect, we can't escape if we neglect so great a salvation because it was first spoken by the Lord, then by His apostles, those who heard Him, to us, and it was authenticated by God through them. Therefore, the author of Hebrews says, you and I need no other verification, we need no other certification, no other stamp of authenticity. Why? It has been once for all delivered and once for all certified. It has been authenticated. And you and I are held guilty, held culpable, and we will not escape if we neglect this book. Because we cannot expect further certification of it. It has already been certified through the apostles, God bearing them witness. That's Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. Next question. Question number three. How is answered prayer? And and this question is a little bit different because this has to do with the issue of providence in prayer, miracles in prayer. What do we pray for? How do we pray? What is appropriate to pray for and what is not? How is answered prayer in specific, unique, sometimes breathtaking ways different from a miracle? Should we ask God for miracles and under what circumstances, if miracles have ceased, should we constrain our prayers to only things that can be answered without a miracle? And do I have to explain away dramatic answers to prayer in my own life as circumstantial? By the way, all these questions came not not from my own mind, but these are the ones that I received back from people when I offered it to you to give me some questions to answer uh, connected with miracles. So how is answered prayer in specific, sometimes breathtaking ways, different from a miracle? Well, remember the difference between a miracle and providence? God can answer prayer in miraculous ways, right? God can also answer prayer in breathtaking, providential ways, where you see the hand of God so specific, so the timing so incredible, the details so incredible, nothing supernatural about it, but you see this coinciding of all the variables in such a way that you say, man, the hand of God is in that, and it's there for everybody to see. So how is a breathtaking answer to prayer different from a miracle if it's not supernatural and it's not a miracle? Maybe you prayed for something and a miracle happened. Somebody was miraculously or incredibly healed from something. Well, that is a miracle, but that most of the time, 90 Nine percent of the time, God does not work through miracles. He works through providence. He just works through natural, normal things to accomplish His will in our lives. And so if it's breathtaking and it's incredible, then it's it could be providential, it could be miraculous. But once you're able to know the difference between the two and recognize providence for what it is, then that, that question sort of answers itself. The next part of the question is, should we ask God for miracles and under what circumstances? I mean, if miracles have ceased, should we pray for them? Well, miracles have not ceased, right? Miracle workers have. 
So should we ask God to work through a miracle worker? Should we take a sick loved one or go if we're sick to a miracle worker and say, God, will you work through him? Is that an appropriate prayer? No. Why? Because that's not how God's working today. But God does do miracles, and so we ought to go directly to the God, our God. And is it appropriate to pray for God to do a miracle? Now say, let me put it this way. The limit on what we pray for has nothing to do with God's ability and, and not really much to do with God's program so much as what we discern to be the will of God in a situation. For instance, I'm coming home from the south end of the bridge, and I hit the south end of the bridge. Friends, as many times as I've wished that I could drive across Lake Ponderé on dry land to my driveway and skip all the headache of downtown, I have never once in my life prayed that God would part Lake Ponderé and provide for me dry ground to drive across on. Why is that? Is it because I don't believe God is able to do that? Do I believe God is able to do that? I believe God could tr- teleport me in an instant from the south end of the Long Bridge to my driveway. Me, my family, my van, everybody and everything I own could be from one place to another. I believe God is able to do that. It has nothing to do with His power. It's just that I am very suspect that it is actually the will of God to part Lake Ponderé and allow me to drive through on dry ground. I don't believe that to be His will. It's not that I don't think He can. It's just that I don't believe that to be in His will. I don't think it would advance His kingdom, His name, His glory, His purpose or anything about Him. So I don't pray for that because I don't think that that's God's will. So instead, I deal with the hassle of downtown. Most of the problem with our prayers is that it's true we have not because we ask not, but whenever we pray, we need to ask ourselves, is this really what I believe to be the will of God? And when we say, in Jesus' name, what we are saying is, grant this, Lord, because I believe it to be Your will for me in Christ. That's what we're asking. So how should we pray for somebody who is sick? Should we pray that God would do something miraculous? Completely legitimate to pray that. And to ask God to do that. If we believe that it would advance His cause, if we believe that it would be within His will, that it is something that God will do, uh, would will to do, and if it's something we believe God could do. Of course, we believe God can do everything. So should we pray for those things? Sure. Nothing wrong with that. We ought to pray in faith. But understand that we always ought to ask ourselves, or say to the Lord, Not what we want or what I want, but I want what you want. And bring my will into conformity with yours. It's amazing if you ever examine your own prayer life, how many of your prayers, and I'm sure this because it's the case with mine, and you're falling like I am, how many of your prayers are offered up with selfish motives? Is that not true? That is the biggest struggle in prayer, is to make sure that what we pray for is actually God's will or would be willed by Him so that we can ask in accordance with His will. And if we do that, then we know we have it. If he will depart Lake Ponderé, and I asked him to depart Lake Ponderé, there's no question in my mind that he would do so. I just don't think it's his will, so I do not bother asking. And maybe I have not because I asked not. But I'm not going to ask. Why? Because I don't think it's his will. Next question. Question number four. Can Satan perform miracles? This is a good one. And how do we distinguish miracles of God from manifestations of the occult? And what about modern-day miracle workers? Are they from God? Can Satan perform miracles? Nope. Cannot. He is a deceiver. He is a liar. He can fabricate effects. He can manipulate the senses. He can deceive the mind. He can twist the truth. He can lead us astray. He can and does all of those things. And there are times when he does all of those things, manipulating the effects and directing the course of things and deceiving people, and people are tricked into believing that what he's actually seeing is a sign or a miracle. Can Satan perform miracles? No. He's very good at imitating them. He's very good at duplicating the effects. And he's very good at deceiving people into thinking that they've seen and experienced something that they have not seen and experienced. He's a master at that. Paul says there are lying signs and wonders. In fact, when the Antichrist comes, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, he's going to come with all deception, with lying signs and wonders, performing tricks, performing quote-unquote miracles, but they're going to be deceptive in nature and they're not going to be the genuine article. If Satan could perform true signs, then there would have been no way to distinguish between a true apostle and a false apostle, would there? Because a false apostle would have been able to simply do the exact same thing that Paul did. But Paul said, no, true signs were done through me. That's how you know I am a spokesman for God because I did the true signs. There are others who duplicated false signs, false miracles. They belong to Satan. So he can't do genuine miracles. There are fake miracles that Satan is able to do. Remember, he's able to duplicate some of the effects of Moses. 
before Pharaoh when, when Moses did his miracles, Satan was able to duplicate those effects. Not genuine miracles, but tricks, sideshows, under the bright lights with a television camera, that type of stuff is what we see Satan doing in Scripture. How do we distinguish between miracles of God from manifestations of the occult? Let me give you a five word. Yeah, five words. Had to, let me get that right. Five word sentence that if you keep this in your mind, you'll, you'll get it right. This will save you from a lot of deception. And here it is. God does not validate error. God does not validate error. He is a God of truth and He hates every false way. So if you see somebody who is performing quote-unquote miracles, tricks, signs, or wonders, you can examine his teaching, examine his life, examine what he believes, and tell if he is from God or not. Because God will not validate a false miracle. He will not validate error. So if somebody comes teaching error, false doctrine, he does not speak according to the law and the prophets. There's no light in him. God is not going to put his stamp of authenticity on that person and say, there you go, he's my spokesman. But he's lying. He doesn't hold up to the standard of the apostles. So God will not validate error. He doesn't put his stamp of blessing upon some false teacher, some heretic who twists Scripture, distorts Scripture, ignores Scripture, and teaches something other than what the apostles taught. So the standard today is not miracles. You may say, well, I know a cousin who went to a Mormon pastor and that Mormon pastor laid hands on him and he was healed. Or I went and saw a Catholic priest and I had a limp and after that I didn't walk with a limp. Look, whatever you want to say about what your experience is, friends, listen. If the individual who performed whatever was performed does not hold up to the standard of the truth of God's Word, if he teaches error and believes error, as would be the case with the Mormon and the Catholic, then whatever happened was not from God. The God of truth was not involved in it. If error is being promoted, then I can guarantee you this, the father of lies was involved in it in some way. You say, well, I experienced that. Sorry to say that. But whatever it was, it was not from God. Because God does not validate error. He does not put his stamp of authenticity upon a heretic. And say, this guy speaks for me when he obviously does not. What about modern day faith healers? Are they from God? Examine their doctrine. Examine their doctrine. Listen to Benny Hinn tell you that you're a little God. That Jesus lost his divinity on the cross. That he was tortured for three days in hell. Listen to him promote his health, wealth, and prosperity gospel and his other gospel, which is a gospel of works where you create your own reality through the words that you speak. Listen to that heretic run off all of his false doctrines and then tell me that he speaks for God because he does a sign. Somebody may come to you and say, but he performed a sign. He did a miracle. He lengthened somebody's leg. I don't care. That's not the standard. The standard is the truth of the Word of God. And if he doesn't hold to this, he's a false teacher and a heretic. And whatever happened, God was not involved in it. It might be something else. It might be a stage show. It might be a trick. It might be an illusion. It might be a hundred things, but it's not a genuine miracle. Next question. How are exorcisms related to miracles? Now, I doubt that if I had not asked that, I'd be willing to bet that if I had not asked that question, not many of you, if any of you, would have even asked that question about miracles, or about exorcisms, would you? Because we don't typically think that exorcisms have anything to do with miracles. We are taught in modern day Christianity that we should be performing exorcisms. This is how we battle Satan. We bind him, we cast him down, we speak his name, we pray against him, we focus on him, we, we cast him out of anything that will stand still long enough for us to lay hands on it. That's the modern day idea of Satan and exorcisms and that this ought to be common fare for Christians. But since we've just gone through the book of Acts and since really this study is sort of birthed from the miracle accounts in the book of Acts. Turn to the book of Acts and let's see what Luke says about exorcisms. Acts chapter 5. There are four times that exorcisms are mentioned in the book of Acts, and we're going to look at all four of those. We're going to answer the question, what about exorcisms? Should they be something that we're do we should be doing? And you can probably guess that from the my tone of voice and from the approach to this that I'm not going to come out on the, yeah, we should be doing exorcism side of this debate. Acts chapter 5, down at verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. Now, from that point to the beginning of or the end of verse 14 is a parenthesis. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico, but none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number. Verse 15 picks up after the parenthesis. So if you read verse 12, jump to 15, you catch the sentence. 
At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, verse 15, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. The apostles were performing signs and wonders among the people. And then Luke does not leave us in the dark as to what he means by signs and wonders. He gives us two illustrations. Those who were sick, physically ill, were being healed. And those who were afflicted by unclean spirits were being healed. Now if you only had that verse to tell you what an exorcism is, what would you put it in the grouping with? A sign and a wonder. That's what Luke says. The apostles were performing signs and wonders. Luke, what kind of signs and wonders? Physical healings where people who were lame were healed and spiritual healings where people who were afflicted were healed of their demonic possession. That is what a sign and a wonder is. Two types. Physical healings and exorcisms. Turn over to Acts chapter 8. Verse 4, Therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Verse 6, The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs that he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Philip was performing signs. What kind of signs? In the case of those who were sick, they were being healed. In the case of those who had unclean spirits, the spirits were coming out of them. Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 8, exorcisms are what? They're classified as signs and wonders. Turn over to Acts chapter 16. Verse 16, this is Paul in the city of Philippi. It happened as we were going to the place of prayer that a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her master's much profit by fortune-telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. Now do you notice that it doesn't classify this exorcism as a sign and a wonder there. Luke has already done that twice. He really doesn't need to repeat it, although he's going to repeat it one more time before we're done. But notice who does the exorcism. Who is it? Come on, you just read it. Paul. And Paul was a what? An apostle. Acts chapter 19. Verse 11. This is in Ephesus, and this is Paul again. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. What is an exorcism? Well, here Luke calls it an extraordinary miracle. As if you have ordinary miracles and extraordinary miracles. But what was going on in Ephesus was phenomenal. Phenomenal miracles. What are phenomenal miracles? Well, there are two kinds of phenomenal miracles according to Luke. Three different times in Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 8, now in Acts chapter 19. Physical healings and spirits leaving people. Exorcisms. A genuine exorcism, friends, is classified as a sign and a wonder. Four times Luke mentions exorcisms in the book of Acts. Three times he calls them signs and wonders, miracles. Three times they are done by an apostle and only one time were they done by a non-apostle. And in all four instances, the people who performed the exorcism also had the ability to raise the dead and to heal the sick. It could not be any clearer. An exorcism is not something that you and I do on our lunch break with a, with a co-worker. It's not something we do with our aunt. It's not something that we do with, a, we have a big meeting and come together. Exorcisms are not that. Exorcisms are signs and wonders. A genuine exorcism is a miracle. And the people who had the ability to do exorcisms also had the ability to heal the sick and raise the dead. So let me ask you this question. If you're sitting here this morning and you think you're an exorcist, you think you have the ability to control demons and command Satan, then let me give you a little test. After church today, we'll all go down to the hospital and you can clean it out. You can heal all of them down there. And then after that, we'll go over to the funeral home and you can raise a few dead people because there's some mourning families in Sandpoint right now. And then when we're done with that, we'll go from nursing home to nursing home. You can heal all the sick people. You can demonstrate to me your apostolic credentials by performing not just an exorcism, quote-unquote, 
but are real and other signs and wonders as well. And you're asking, but what about, I know somebody, I know a guy who did an exorcism, I know a guy who was there, I saw it, he saw the, he heard the, the little girl speak in the deep rascally voice and said, my name is Legion for we are many. And I, and I heard all about that and I got a friend who was there and, or I saw it happen myself or I was taught this at Bible college. Jim, what are you going to do about that? Because I, what? Experienced something that doesn't seem to fit with scripture. What are you going to do with my experience? Well, let me suggest something to you, because I, I think there is a way of explaining the experiences in light of what we know in Scripture. Don't you think it's possible, just theoretically, let's just go out on a limb here for a second, don't you think it's possible, at least theoretically possible, that the father of lies, the master of deception, just might be deceiving large portions of Christians into thinking that they can control him? Theoretically possible, maybe? that the deceiver could be deceiving people and getting them running down rabbit trails and off involved in all of these things that make no difference whatsoever and ignoring the real issue, which is the proclamation of the gospel truth and the defense of the gospel. Do you think it's possible that it might be deception? Do you know that between Romans and Revelation, there is not one command to exercise demons? There is not one time where we are told to do that. There is not one time we are expected to do that. There is not one instruction in all of the New Testament to any person or to any church on how to perform an exorcism. Not one. The silence is deafening. And the only thing that can account for that is that it was a miracle. And we were not intended to do it. Not at all. Miracles were performed by whom? The apostles. Exorcisms are what? They're miracles. The apostles are dead. And there's nothing in the New Testament that says you and I ought to be carrying on that legacy. So should we be involved in it? Not at all. What then do we do with somebody saying, Jim, do you believe that, do you not believe that people can be demon possessed today? Oh, I most certainly do. In fact, I think I've run across a couple of them. Dark people that I would say, I, I would bet they're demon possessed. Because you meet them and you're in their presence and the hair on the back of your head just stands up. Do we think that there are demon possessed people today? Sure I do. What did they need? Do they need an exorcism? Do they need a power encounter? What is it that they need? What is it that transfers us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? What is it that delivers us completely from sin, Satan, and self? It is nothing other than the glorious truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets us free. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, and by that gospel He has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And the minute you say to me, but they need an exorcism first, then you have just told me the gospel is not enough. It cannot deliver people from Satan. It can only give them forgiveness of their sins. And I would go to the wall to argue against that. They don't need an exorcism. They don't need a power encounter. What they need is the gospel. And instead, we have Christians who are running around doing all these exorcisms, and guess what? The gospel is being sidetracked entirely. Next question. And I think this is the last one. Is healing a miracle? And should we pray for healing? Is it only a miracle if they wouldn't have gotten well on their own? And if they would have gotten well on their own, then why pray? Is healing a miracle? Well, that, that really depends on how the healing is done, is it not? Let me give you two scenarios. You go to the doctor because you're not feeling well. They run some blood tests and do some scans, and the doctor comes out, and the doctor says, yeah, I have bad news. You've been diagnosed with cancer. Now, the cancer is an aggressive form of cancer, but it is treatable, it is operable, and it's early enough that we think you can catch it, and we think that you have a good chance of surviving. We want you to know that there are people who have been at your stage who have died. There are people who have been worse than you who have lived. So you have a 50-50 chance of surviving. So we're going to start treatments immediately. We're going to do surgery. We're going to give you some chemotherapy. We're going to be in treatments and do the best that we can. And you're thankful. So you, you leave there. You go home. You call up your church family. You put it on the prayer chain. Everybody begins to pray. The elders come over. They pray. And what we pray for is that God would do something miraculous, and if he chooses not to heal through a miracle, that he would heal through doctors and providence and technology and the healing processes of your body. So you go in for a checkup, and the cancer is still there. So they operate, and they do the treatments, and you go through all of that for six, eight months, or whatever it takes. After two years, you're pronounced cancer-free, and the cancer never comes back, and you live to a ripe old age of 90 years old and die in a car accident, not from cancer. Now, did God heal you in answer to prayer? Certainly did. Is it a miracle or is it providence? It's providence. Because it wasn't a miraculous healing. There's nothing supernatural. 
but it was a providential healing. Does God deserve any less credit or less glory for healing you providentially than He does if He heals you miraculously? Not at all. He is to be glorified still. Now let me give you a second scenario. You go into the doctor because you're feeling sick and ill, and so they do some blood tests and they do some scans. They do an x-ray, then they do more blood tests, and then they do an MRI, and then they do a pet scan and a cat scan and a dog scan and a bird scan and all the other scans. And then they come out and the radiologist is there and the specialist is there and your family doctor is there and, and all of the doctors are there in the room and they say, look, you've got a very aggressive form of cancer. Your chance of surviving this is nothing. It's in 99% of your body. You're going to be dead within a month. Go home, pick out the hymns for your funeral, get your affairs in order, say goodbye to your wife and kids because it's over for you. Now, that's why I'm a pastor and not a physician because that would be my bedside manner. And so I, the doctor says that to you and you leave there and you're on your way home. You stop by Red Lobster and Baskin Robbins because after all, you're going to be dead for in a month. So why take the chance that there's not going to be lobster in heaven? You might as well enjoy it here on earth. So you stop by Red Lobster and Baskin Robbins. You go home. You call up your church family and we all begin to pray. The elders come over and we lay hands on you and pray. And you go in the following week for a checkup. And on the way to the doctor's office, you stop at Red Lobster and Baskin Robbins because <laughs> after all, you're going to be dead in three weeks now. And so here you've upped the uh, lobster intake. And the doctor does blood tests, MRIs, PET scans, CAT scans, dog scans, all of the scans, and they come back in and they sit down and say, we don't know how to explain this to you, but there's not a, there's not a cell of cancer in your whole body. We have no idea what happened. We have no idea how to explain it. But here's the photo from last week. Here's the photo from today. You can see the cancer in your body here, and it's all gone over here. We don't know what to tell you, but it's gone. Now, can God do that? Does God do that? Oh, he absolutely does. Friends, I know people who have had stories just like that. Do we give God glory for doing that? Yeah, we most certainly do. Is that a miracle? That's a miracle. I can't be explained naturally. And God does those types of things. And we give him glory for doing those types of things. And we pray that God would do those types of things. And then when he does those types of things, we honor him whether he chooses to heal through miracles or through providence. Or listen, whether he chooses not to heal and takes you home to your ultimate healing. You know, getting cancer and dying is not the worst thing in the world that can happen to you. You understand that? Dying is, unless you don't know Christ, dying is not the worst thing in the world that can happen to you. This last week, while I was preparing this part of my message, actually, I was actually typing out this illustration about the cancer. And my computer bonged at me, bing bong, or bonged, I don't know if that's a word, but it, it, it signaled to me that an email had come in. So I pulled up the email, and it was an email from my cousin. She said, as you know, my mom has been diagnosed with cancer. And she went down to such and such a guy at Faith Ministries down in Post Falls, and he laid hands on her and told her that the cancer is gone. Then she asked me this question, what do you think about that type of stuff? Always glad when people ask me my opinion. Always ready to give it. So I gave it to her. And I told her what my opinion of it was. I said, I think your mom has been handed a false hope. And it's going to crush her when she goes to the doctor and finds out that God does not heal through faith healers. And if God does heal through that faith healer, since the faith healer is a heretic, was that healing from God or was it from some other source? It was a deception of some other source. But the real hope is in God who does the miracles and not in some faith healer. Let me end on a real, a real sober note for you. As if all the talk about cancer and dying has not been sober enough. <laughs> let, me on, let me end on a sobering note for you. Friends, sometimes it is not God's will to heal you. Sometimes it's not God's will to heal you. Sometimes it's God's will to take you home. Sometimes it's God's will that you would endure suffering and endure affliction so that you might give him glory in that and in that response to it and that you would call out to him. Sometimes it is God's will to heal you. Sometimes he just gives you the grace to deal with what he's brought into your life. has nothing to do with your lack of faith. has nothing to do with any wrong thing that you've done or any sin in your life likely. Sometimes God just allows you to endure affliction because your faith is strong enough to handle it. And he wants to purify it and make it stronger. And we live in a, amongst a Christian generation that that wants all of the blessings of the future life now. We want all of the wealth, all of the health, all of the healing, all of the blessings, all of the faith, all of the glory, all of the comforts, all of the ease. We want everything that is promised in the next life, and we want it now. And then we're told, if you don't have that now, there's something wrong with your faith. And that's a lie. 
All, we will get all of those things. We will get all, we will get healing. We will get a new body. We will get all of the health, all of the wealth, all of the blessings, all of the comfort, all of the ease, all of the glory. We get all of that. But not in this life. We get it in the next life. Sometimes we get glimpses in this life of the blessings of the life to come. But we shouldn't hold those too closely. Because God did not intend for us to enjoy heavenly blessings while we're here on earth. We get all of that. But not now. And Christians sometimes think God is like a vending machine. Cosmic vending machine. You go up and you say, okay, I got my faith. I claim my promise. I had hands laid on me. I did the anointing oil thing. I sent away my gift to such and such. And so then I... I claim my verse, I ask God, I pull the handle, ching, voila, a miracle. It's not how God works. He is the sovereign God who heals according to His will, in His timing, if He wants. You and I cannot coerce His hand. All we can do is submit joyfully to His sovereign purpose and plan and accept it as it comes to Him, from Him. My friends, I hope that all of these questions has helped to answer or at least I should say, I should hope the last couple of weeks has served to answer some of your questions, if not all of your questions. Um, if you have any more, and I'm sure that maybe some things have been raised in your mind in going through these last couple of weeks that I haven't answered, I'm at the back, as always, feel free to come up and ask me any more questions that you have about this or talk about this, if this is something that you're really struggling with. But I hope this has served to clear up some of the issues about miracles and what God's purpose for them was and what God does now today. Do we believe that God does miracles? Absolutely. No question about it. But He does it His way, not ours. In His timing, not ours. And according to His will, not ours. And you say, boy, that sounds like a real impersonal God. No, it is the sovereign God of heaven. And next week, Lord willing, we'll dive right back into the text of the book of Acts and we'll be back in Acts chapter 28. So let's close by praying together. Our Father, we thank You that You are glorious beyond description, all-powerful, unchangeable, holy, omnipotent. You reign and You do according to Your will at all times. We thank You that You are that God. You are worthy of our confidence, our trust, and our obedience. And we ask that You would give us the grace to render all of those to You through the promptings of Your Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.